My name is Michael Shane. How many here has seen me before? Okay. How many here has uh, seen stuff on the YouTube videos with me? Okay. Um, I'll ask anyone later if you have any questions that you might want to ask. Let's see. This first part of the story is a story I've been telling for 30 years, so I'm a little tired of it, so I'm going to just give you the quick and skinny of it. Um, I was uh, <coughs> prophesized by a well-known medium that even some of you might even have heard of uh, back in 1959. His name was Reverend Keith Milton Reinhardt. Um, he uh, went in a trance and apparently Jesus materialized and came out and told my mother, who was 15 at the time, that she was going to give birth to a baby boy on July 4th, 1963 at 11.59 a.m. and that I would have similar gifts as the medium that was presently in that cabinet. And a lot of other things were said as well about what I would be doing in this, in this life. Well, I was born July 2nd, 1963 at 11.59 a.m. Two days earlier than what was said, but everything else was correct. So I thought that was pretty, pretty good, you know, um, especially when there is really no space and time. Um, that was a pretty good uh, uh, prophecy. I was supposed to be raised by the church, and, which I was for almost seven years, uh, and not by my, by my parents. And I ended up in the custody of my mother for, um, at the age of seven, and then a gentleman who I thought was my father and, uh, and then ended up going back to live with my grandparents when I was, uh, had just turned 15 years old. By then, I was a cranky, uh, obnoxious, troublemaking kid who, all, who, who basically took his anger and his upset and, and fears and everything out on just being someone to make money. So I, and my grandparents bought a farm I, I, I raised and traded for cows, pigs, chickens. I had 3,500 rabbits, um, a pond with catfish in it that I uh, put in there and raised to sell to the local uh, restaurants and stuff. Because in Texas, they really like that uh, deep fried catfish and hush puppies. Um, if you go to Texas, ask for that and you'll understand what that is. It's really good though. So. At the age of 27, um, I attempted to leave this world and ended up in a treatment center with a roommate by the name of George Carlin. Now, he was a very famous American um, comedian. And two weeks before I was to get out of, the, out of there, um, I'm just sitting here on my bed. He's over here supposedly sleeping in the other bed. And I'm noticing this little pinpoint of light on this wall locker and I'm watching this light so like you couldn't get your eyes off of it you know you're like looking at this light and I'm see you know I'm, I'm still kind of upset you know because everything that was told to me as a little boy doesn't seem to be occurring and um, and those 20 years that I went through from the age of 7 to 27 I call my dark <coughs> ages and I did a lot of different things during that period of time um, one of which was getting in trouble. <laughs> Anyone innocent of not getting in trouble? <laughs> so, um, did someone raise their hand over here? You? I can believe that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, so, the light got bigger, 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 bigger. And then out come this figure from the light. Um, it looked to me like Jesus, but not like you would see on the picture on the wall. He didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, or, you know, it, but he, he looks at me and he says, and he's holding my, my right foot. And he says, all you have to do is focus on your heart and what you want will come clear. Create that and the rest of your life will be just fine. And I wanted to ask questions, but he backs up and disappears into the light and the light disappeared. 
So I'm up for another three hours contemplating what he said, wondering if I was just hallucinating because they had us on these weird drugs in this place. And I went to sleep. I wake up. I'm sitting on the side of my bed thinking about what happened earlier. And all of a sudden, here's this voice. Well, are you going to listen to what he said? It was George Carlin. You heard that? Yeah, I've been talking to Jesus all my life. And I thought that was really funny, and I thought he was joking, but he heard what he said. So um, I thought about that, and it was just because of what he said. I, I really got into it, and I, and I just had a thought that, you know what? I really would like to get back into doing this work, the spiritual work. Next thing I know, on my day out, when they let me go, my wife come and pick me up, my, um, get home, my, my phone rings, so we didn't have cell phones yet, and it's my mother asking me if I remembered these two people that used to work with Keith Reinhardt back in the day. And I said, yeah, I remember them. I said, well, they're here visiting, and they would like to see you. You know, Can you come out? Ah, I was tired and everything because of the treatment center and everything, you know. But I couldn't think up any excuse, so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll be out there. So I went out there, and he, and he did a thing called past life regression on me. Um, it was pretty traumatic. Afterwards, I felt pretty good for about two weeks, and I called him up. I said, i got to have more of this. So I ended up moving to, um, uh, I transferred my job. I was a mechanic for Sears at the time to Sacramento, California. And as I was going through these healing sessions, I started seeing all these weird things again. Spirits and hearing them. I was seeing etheric chords in people that goes back to certain experiences of this life and other lives. I mean, it was just really weird. In fact, it was really making it hard for me to walk because I was so dizzy from everything happening to me all at once that it was pretty difficult. Um, but the one thing that, that I wasn't able to do was talk. I was very quiet. I didn't say much at all. I just sat there, smoked my cigarettes, and drank my beer, and, and, and that was it. And one day during a, a regression, he notices, a, a, and I notice, a black uh, kind of like tar here in my voice box. So we look at it, we remove it, and I haven't shut up since, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, be, um, I go back, I'm, I'm talking, yep, 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 all the way home. We get to the home, and I'm sitting on the couch because I'm living with these two people. And Kathy comes out of the kitchen and says, what's wrong with him? Is he stoned? No, we just removed this thing in his voice box. And I'm just, yep, 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 because I'm just sitting there talking, and I haven't really been quiet ever since. So the, the thing is, sometimes you have to sacrifice things in your life to get what you want and um, I left my my wife at the time and two of my kids um, I attempted to get custody of them but in Washington State the chances of the, the of the father getting custody of the kids is very 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 slim um, even if you can prove that that the wife is a is a drug addict which she wasn't um, uh, so I had to sacrifice that, and now my present wife and my present children, Shannon and Rosie, they kind of have to take a second seat to to me doing this work. And my wife accepted it at the moment we got married, kind of. And my girls right now are just more interested in my youngest is graduating this year or next year, and my other daughter is in or trying to get into college. And uh, they're focusing on that and moving, you know, out and doing things. Uh, but but being but growing up when dad was gone most of the time, um, it was a little rough for them. And and I noticed that. And I and I and I come and I do this work. You, you really got to understand how important this work is to me to put my family on on this you know, a second shelf. And I hope that it's just as important 
to all of you here because there are things that come through that are of knowing and then there's things that come through that just you just scratch your head and don't really get it. Well, the stuff that you don't get, I recommend that you educate yourself. Read. Look on the internet. For Christ's sakes, use the internet for something more than bashing someone on social media. You know, that really gets my goat. Um, I don't even get on it anymore because of it. Social media can be used as a good thing. St. Germain calls it the modern day devil. Um, because people have actually committed suicide because of people saying certain things um, on, the, on the internet. And in fact, my daughter's best friend hung herself because of something that was said on the internet. Or neighbor too. Really? Your neighbor too? 17. 17. So was the girl. So read and educate yourself. There are lessons out there. Um, if you can't find anything, get a hold of this guy. He's got all kinds of lessons from the Ascended Masters. And most of the stuff will go over your head. Um, but you've got to listen to it over and over and over and over and over. Mediums are coming out of the woodwork these days. When I started doing this, there was a few mental mediums, but, but no physical mediums. Definitely no one that was apporting. And now you got Kai, um, who uh, apports um, certain objects. Uh, right now, that's the only one that I'll mention, but <coughs> the other ones I'm not sure. But they're there, you know, and it's because time is moving faster now in the history, ever in the history of the world. It's just moving faster which also gives you a clue that time really doesn't exist the way we understand it. Apportation in India. Yeah, there's, there's apportations in India. There's a, she was 12 at the time, but she was apporting these little crystals out of her eye. I think that was Pakistan. That was Lebanon. Lebanon. But in India, there's a place where there's, there's an ashram where there's a girl that apports all the time. And, there's, and then Sai Baba, who passed away a year or two ago, um, he apported a five-ounce uh, gold ingot in front of 5,000 people. Uh, right there in his hand. It just, it was empty, and there it was. And he's holding it up like that. Um, this is not, the apportation scenario is not something new. There isn't really that many out there that do this anymore, but there is dangers to, to doing this because you're opening up yourself to a uh, different dimension of sorts. And you're kind of, and this is going to sound a little stomach wrenching, but you're kind of ripping yourself out inside out by having yourself in the physical and the etherical at the same time. You know, that creates a lot of physical pain. Um, I used to be in so much pain that I'd go home crying. But now I feel that like Jesus is holding my heart and kind of separates me from my body a little bit. And so I don't feel the pain. What I, what I feel is it sure would be nice to breathe, you know, because like recently in Basel, um, a few days ago, last week, um, through me, the Masters apported 36 um, uh, solid silver coins along with gemstones. Um, and, and we were under scientific uh, means there was a scientist there, some of you might know him, Eckhart Cruz. Yes. Yeah, you know him too? Uh, is anybody you don't know? <laughs> um, that's a joke. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, that was pretty amazing. And yeah, you can pass it around and you, you probably have to walk around with it. There's, if you go to his website, there's some uh, other kind of testing he did on me. Thermal imaging, voice analysis, um, everything that he's doing. 